It's the summer of 1980 in East Millinocket in a small town in the heart of Maine. A young girl called Joyce McLean spent the time at her family lakeside camp reading comic books, swimming in the lake, gossiping with her friends and enjoying the hot weather when one day she goes missing after her usual evening run. Hi, my name is Sarah Jade and welcome to my channel where we talk about true crime, unsolved cases and more. If this is something you're interested in, feel free to subscribe. Now let's get into this week's case. So in this week's case, we're going to be talking about Joyce McLean and how she went missing one evening after her usual run around the town. When she didn't come home that evening, her mum became worried and reported her missing to the police. Joyce McLean was born on the 4th of September in 1960 to parents Pam and Michael McLean. They lived in a small town in East Millinocket in the heart of Maine. It was a town where everyone knew each other and no one locked their doors and they all got on very well. Joyce went to Shank High School and she was very popular and well known among her students. She was also very talented and amazing on the saxophone. She could listen to any music and just play it by ear. She was also an honour student and an officer of the student body. Alongside music, she was also really into sports. She liked to play soccer, tennis and basketball and liked to keep fit. She had just got her driving licence and was looking forward to going to college and was just planning her 17th birthday party, which was going to be a party on the lake. She had spent her summer hanging around with friends, reading comic books, enjoying the sunshine, and hanging out at her family's lakeside camp. Joyce had grown up with her friends Laura and Teresa, and on the 8th of August, she had gone to the local town swimming pool and spent the day with her friends. That evening, as the sun was going down, she decided to go on her usual run around the town. Her friend was supposed to go with her. Her parents had told her at the last moment that she had to babysit, so she wasn't able to come on the run with her. She had left her house around 7.30 and said goodbye to her mum, went off on her usual run. She would usually run around the town and go behind the school and run around the playing fields before coming back. On that evening, around 7.45, a witness saw her turn around the corner and go around the side of the school towards the playing fields, and that was the last time anyone had seen her. It was around 8.30 and Joyce still hadn't come home. Her mum started to get worried, as usually she wouldn't be out that long, and if she was, she would have given her mum a call and just let her know where she was. She decided to go in her car and just drive around and see if she can see her. When she couldn't find her, she came back home and decided to give her dad a call. When she spoke to her dad, Michael, he mentioned that there was a big party going on with all her friends down the street and she'd probably gone there and forgotten to tell her mum and was just enjoying the party. Although Pam thought this was strange that she didn't tell her, she thought she'd, you know, she's a teenager and she'd just leave her for the night and see her in the morning. After a wet and thunderous evening, Pam woke up the next morning and Joyce still wasn't home. At this, she started to panic and she called some of her friends and family and they came round to help her look for her. When at lunchtime they still hadn't heard from her, Pam decided to call the police and report her as missing. They also called around all her friends and see if she'd been there or if they'd heard anything from her, but no one had seen her since the day before. 24 hours later and still no one has heard from her, so all her friends and family decided to come back to the McLean's house to discuss how they were going to go out the next day and go for a big search and look for her. So they all turn up at the house and start discussing what they're going to do when a young man called Peter Larley turns up. Her mum thought this was very strange. She'd never th heard of Peter. He was about four years older than Joyce and she was sure he wasn't one of her friends. So they all planned to meet at the house the next morning and go out from the house and look for her together. However, Peter, for some reason, decides to go earlier in the morning out on his own to look for her. And when he does, and he's walking down a dirt road by the power lines, he comes across her dead body lying in the clearing. She looked like she'd been badly beaten and wasn't breathing. So he ran home immediately and called the police. When they arrived, he took them to the scene and showed them where she was. Joyce's body was found in the clearing behind the school. It was on the dirt road near the local power lines and it was an area where the kids used to go and drink and smoke and it was known as the local party area for the kids in the area. Her body was found in a rock and she was lying face down and she was lying on her side with the left side of her face laying against the ground. She was nearly naked and she was bound up with some of her clothes. She had been badly beaten and had a fractured skull after being repeatedly hit over the head. They thought it was attempted rape as she had been missing most of her clothes and they had found bruising on her but there was no sign of rape. It was believed that she was struck with a fatal blow to the back of her head while she was laying down. And next to the body they found a heavy glass and ceramic insulator that was used to protect the power lines. Search dogs were then used to track her scent. They followed her scent to a stone wall that was quite near this crime scene. This is when they found her clothes tucked behind the stone wall. The dogs also followed the scent down the dirt road and past the houses. 
They believe this is where the perpetrator fled after the incident. Detective Chief Doe then has to go and inform her mother of the news. Her family is shocked and devastated by the news. The police start to investigate and they first believe that it's not someone in the town. But everyone in the area starts to get worried and starts to lock their doors and keep their children inside. There had been a state football game that Friday night and they start to speculate that maybe it was someone that came into the town that night. There was also a huge construction project at the mill factory and 700 workers had come into the area to work. However, after investigating over the next few days, they could find no links and they start to believe that maybe it was someone closer to home. They start to go through her yearbook and pick out any of the boys in there that may have some connection with Joyce. They then go around and question all of them just to get their alibi and find out if they had any connection to Joyce and what had happened to her. However, they have no joy in this and they bring them no further along in the case. They then start to have another theory about Peter Lally. They found it very strange that he didn't know Joyce, but he'd gone there that day to help her. And then he'd gone out on his own and coincidentally had just found her. There was also a strange incident about a week after Joyce's disappearance. Pam had come home one evening and he was standing on their porch and was acting very strange. So she started to get her suspicions about him. So the police spent a lot of time investigating him. And he said that he was at the high school with his friends having a few drinks. When they check out his alibi, it all matches up. His friends say that he was there that night, they'd had a couple of drinks and they'd gone driving in their trucks around the town. He also took a polygraph test and passed it. This cleared him from the investigation and he was no longer a suspect in the case. After these initial searches and investigations, they were no further along in the case and the case started to grow cold. On the same evening as Joyce's disappearance, there was another incident in the town. A young man called Philip Scott Fournier, known as Scott, was in a car accident that nearly cost him his life. The events were strange because Scott had driven his bike and taken it down to the local businesses where he had broken in and had stolen the oil tank. He rammed it through the garage doors and crashed into a car. It appeared that he was heading out of town and the police wanted to speak to him about the incident. However, he was in no state to talk as he had been in a coma and was recovering in hospital. A few weeks later, he regained consciousness. However, he had suffered a traumatic brain injury and didn't remember much of the events that night. Ten months later and Peter started to get some of his memories back and some of them were quite disturbing. So he asked his stepfather to take him to go and see Pastor Thomas who was head of the Calvary Church at the time. When he got there he was crying, he was distraught and was very upset. The pastor sat him down and started to speak to him. He then agreed to take him to Bangor Police Station so there's no speculation and he can just talk freely to the police. When he gets to the police station the police start to question him and ask him what he remembers about that night. As they question him further he remembers that he was at a friend's party that night called Adam Austin and he overheard that a girl had been assaulted and attacked. He said he didn't remember much after that but he did believe when he was walking home drunk that he tripped over a young girl and he believed that she may have been tied up. However the police think because of his brain injury and the fact that he can't remember much the police start to think that he doesn't have enough information and send him home. Over time as Grant's memory starts to come back they start to question him more and one of the memories that start to come back to him was that a boy called Grant and his friends had taken her out into the woods and hadn't come back. He'd heard screaming, but nothing else. Grant Boyton was one of her friends and his family also owned a cottage on the lake, right next to the Maclean's. He'd grown up with Joyce and they used to spend their summers together water skiing on the lake. And people couldn't believe that he'd be responsible for this. The police investigate all of Scott's leads, but her friends don't believe that she would have gone to the party that night on her own. And especially wouldn't have left to go into the woods with a group of guys on her own. They discovered that everyone's got an alibi except for Grant. Based on this, they arrested him and brought him in for questioning. Grant said that he got very drunk that night, but he didn't attack anybody. As he'd been drinking so much, he'd been feeling sick and went outside to the back of the house and was sick over the edge into the garden. But no one had come out there with him, so no one could vouch for the time that he wasn't there. And based on this, he became a suspect for the case. He was given a polygraph test and the first one came back inconclusive. However, he did pass his second one. They questioned Scott further and he definitely believes that it was Grant that was there and had taken her into the woods and never came back with her. Based on this, they bring Grant in for further questioning and say to him, you might as well tell us what happened. We've got to find out anyway. And you might as well tell us now as you've tried as a juvenile. But he sticks to his story and doesn't change anything. They don't have enough information as it's Grant's word against his. And Grant had suffered a brain injury and some of the details that he'd mentioned were incorrect. He'd said that she'd been bound up with some rope. However, she was actually bound up with a piece of her own clothing. He also said that her clothes were yellow but in fact they were pink. So based on these inconsistencies and the fact that he had a brain injury, they didn't have enough evidence to convict Grant and he was let go. However, a lot of people were still suspicious of Grant and he found it very hard to get a job after this and it caused him a lot of torment in the following years. 
Over the next few years, they continue to interview Grant and find out inf more information as his memories come back. He starts to mention other people that may have been there that night and they follow up on all these leads. However, after a while, they start to question the reliability of his information due to his brain injury, the fact that he wasn't bringing any leads. So they start to look at other leads in the case. The case starts to go cold until two years later, the lead detective of the case, Detective Joe Sambini, is struck by the similarities between Joyce's case and a case that had happened in Bangor. In March 1983, three years after Joyce's disappearance, a young girl called Justin Gridley was abducted while she was running one evening. She had been raped and murdered and her clothes had also been found hidden inside a wall. The case had been solved and a man called Joe Albert was convicted of her murder. Before his capture, he was overheard talking about the McLean case. He had worked at a bar and mentioned being in Milnocky and knew information about her murder. He'd already served time for killing his girlfriend in 1970 and was released early and he'd only been out a couple of years before he murdered Justin. They believed that he was responsible but they had nothing linking him to the case. So they have convinced Joyce's mum Pam to write him a letter and plead to him to let her know whether he killed her daughter or not. He eventually writes back and says it wasn't him and he doesn't know anything about the case and doesn't think he'd be able to help her to solve the case. She believes him and also there was no evidence linking him to the case. He also didn't drive a car so it had been very hard for him to be in the area at that time. Some believed that he'd worked with someone else and they had had a van and helped him. However, there was no evidence that linked him to the area or her murder. On the fifth anniversary of Joyce's disappearance, Pam, her mum, had had enough of the police. They had got no further along and the case had grown cold. So she started to push for justice and put a group together called Justice for Joyce. She was very relentless and people in the town started to donate money to her to help her to get a private investigator to try and find information about the case. She then spent the next 20 years pushing the case to try and get information to find out what had happened to her daughter. Over time, the forensic science had come a long way and Pam believed that this could help in the case. She thought if they had exhumed her daughter's body, they would be able to test it for DNA and find out who'd done this to her. However, when she campaigned to get this done, they said there was no point doing this. The years, too many years had gone past and they were unlikely to find anything. They heartlessly showed her a picture of her nails and said, look how short her nails are. We'd never be able to find DNA on that. Based on this, Pam's faith began to waver for the police. She'd asked them plenty of questions about her daughter's case and no one seemed to know full details about what happened that night and the events that occurred and small details that they should know as investigators of the case. She then starts to raise money herself so she can get her daughter privately exhumed and get the DNA. And finally, in 2008, two famous forensic scientists, Dr. Michael Baden and Dr. Henry Lee, agree to help her with the case. They perform the autopsy and say that her body is preserved by 85 to 90 percent. They were able to collect three hairs from her and some fingerprints and are taken to the lab for DNA testing. The DNA is compared to all six people they feel relevant in the case, including Scott's. However, the DNA comes back as hers and they're no further along in the case. They believe due to the heavy rain that occurred that night, all the DNA had probably been washed away. Due to the coverage of this case, however, the police decide that the main state police start the investigation again as if it had happened just yesterday. They assign a cold case team to her case. They start to go through all the information and all the interviews and evidence they collected. When investigating the case, they found that Scott had gone down to the Bangor police in that May of 1981. However, when they looked at the evidence, there was no evidence there that recorded the interview. On this, they decided to track down the pastor that had taken them there to see if he could give them any information about what had happened in that interview. They find him down in Florida and they get a shock discovery when he tells them that he can tell them all about that night and how Scott had revealed that he had killed Joyce. He said that Scott admitted to him that he'd killed Joyce that night. He said that when he was attacking her, Joyce had kicked him, so he picked up the insulator and struck her over the head. This had caused the fatal blow that killed her. His account matched the evidence they had. No one had known about the insulator, so they kept it quiet, and he'd known all the details of what had happened. The pastor had also asked him if he had had sex with her that night. He said he didn't because she was in her period. When they were doing the autopsy, they did find a tampon, but no one had known about that, so that was something else that linked him to the case. He also admitted that he did tell the police this, but they didn't believe him because of his brain injury. Altogether, he had given over 30 interviews over the years and they had to go for each one. And when they did, they start to see a scary pattern. He was very good at deflecting and he used to point the finger at different people so the police would go off and investigate them and keep them away from himself. They also then speak to a lot of people that were close to Scott around the time. His parents revealed that he had a fascination with Joyce and he had seen her out jogging and all of a sudden he had started to stop smoking and wanted to take up jogging himself. 
There was also a couple of teenagers that were hanging out around near the school around the time that Joyce had went running and they had seen Scott at the same time. Finally, he also admitted it to one of his supervisors, John DeRoche. This occurred in January 1989. He'd heard where he came from and asked him if he'd known about the case. He said he was actually the one that killed her and when he asked how he got away with it, he had deflected the police because he just said he didn't remember anything because of his brain injury and he'd give them different names and send them down all these different rabbit holes which stopped them looking into himself. He said after nine months after his injury he had remembered everything and that's why he'd gone to the police. So after 36 years after Joyce's death they finally go and arrest Scott for her murder. He's taken into custody and when he goes to court he pleads not guilty. He said he was the one that helped the police and had not killed her. However through all his confessions and the fact they found out that he had tried to kill himself that night, the jury came back nine days later and found him guilty. He was sentenced to 45 years in prison at the age of 57. He is now currently appealing his sentence. This case is so frustrating that her mother had to wait 36 years to get her justice. However, through the perseverance of her mum alone, she was able to get the justice that she deserved. Thank you for watching the video. Please take care of yourself and I'll see you in the next one. You call me a saint, but you know I'm a stranger, a willing and able.